Um, thank you. So I'm hoping you can see my screen and hear me okay, everyone? Yes. Yes, okay, great. So um, thank you, Bob. And I also wanna thank the organizers of the meeting. This so far has been a really amazing meeting. And I think it'll continue that way throughout the week. So when Valerie asked me to give this talk, I had some things in mind. And I think these are um, parameters or maybe even considerations or nuances um, that we can think about for all, all parts of lipid analysis. And whether you're an old hat at this or you're new to this field, and even from the just the day and a half of um, the um, presentations we've seen, you can see that there are parameters and considerations and nuances that take place in all of these categories, be it the lipid species we're wanting to measure, the chromatography that we utilize or we do not utilize, and the mass analyzer of choice. And so in this um, brief time period, um, what I can do is just provide some additional examples of why these are important, starting with my experiences as a postdoc in Ian Blair's lab, doing icosanoid analysis, moving on to my own research, um, looking at the formation and signaling of bioactive electrophilic fatty acids, and from my directorship of the core in which we performed a lot of untargeted lipidomics or lipid, global lipid profiling analyses. And so we heard um, both great talks from Bob talking about sample preparation and the use of internal standards. And we know that the gold standard in quantification is to have a stable isotope labeled internal standard for every analyte or lipid species of interest. And also it has already been brought up that as the number of lipid species or metabolites profiled increases, the reliability of that quantification decreases. And so I think with the use of internal standard um, lipid mixes and um, a nice one sold by Avanti, so we don't even have to make our own inter internal standard mixes, we're now able to at least normalize um, class metabolites using corresponding class specific internal standards, which gives us a normalization within an experiment. I think it's important to note that we can look at this as a relative quant and if we're looking at lipid species between say a control group and um, a treated group or a knockout mouse model where we're looking at say liver, we can compare within the experiment, but it's very challenging with this relative quant to um, compare to anything that's been published in the literature as far as amount. And we can't assume that a relative quant in any way has, um, has to do with any uh, type of absolute quantification for these species. And so also for standards, we can think of these species in terms of um, internal QCs for our LCMS system. So standards can be utilized to look at retention time drift over the course of our analysis, as well as signal inten intensity from the mass spectrometer. And we, in some, time, in some cases, when doing large lipidomic studies, these analyses can take place over several days to even a week of constant analysis. So it's really important to keep these factors um, under control. Another really important utilization of standards is to is um, for confirmation of lipid identifi identification, and this is really critical and very necessary um, in publications. So when we're going to publish on a lipid of, say, from a novel enzymatic reaction, something that hasn't really been published much on in the literature previously, it's really important that we show our representative chromatogram from our biological sample, as well as a comparison to a standard um, representative chromatogram and product ion spectra as well. Even if this ends up in the supplemental, it gives confidence to the readers and reviewers that we know what we're measuring. So what happens though when there is no standard? And Bob touched upon this um, for the more complex lipids like triglycerides, we can't have a standard for every um, triglyceride or complex lipid species. And um, as I mentioned, my work is more focused on looking at um, electrophilic fatty acids. And this also can happen in the case of looking at less complex lipids and looking at different oxidation products of fatty acids. And so in this case here, we were interested in looking at the oxidation product of lipoxin A4, which is 15 oxolipoxin A4. And this can be formed from the oxidation um, enzymatically through 15 hydroxyprostaglandin dehydrogenase. And in this case, we wanted to create enough standard that we could confirm our lipid identification in our system, but we also wanted to test out the biological activity of 15-oxolipoxin A4 as it had been previously reported to be inactive. 
And so in order to do this, um, we employed um, our organic uh, um, chemist, Stephen Woodcock, to come up with a multi-step synthesis plan, which eventually led to the, um, to the synthesis of, of 15 oxo lipoxin A4 methyl ester. And of course, throughout this um, multi-step synthesis at, um, for the creation of different intermediates, as well as the final product of the methyl ester, um, protein NMR, carbon-13 NMR, and other bioanalytical techniques were done for the verification of the lipid identity and structural confirmation. And so this um, paper was published um, a little while ago now, and we're in the process of wrapping up our um, investigation into the biological activity of this <clears throat> electrophilic fatty acid. And so there are some other um, properties or considerations to take into account of the different lipid species, be them the analyte of interest or the standard or internal standard we are using, um, such as concentration in um, your biological sample, as well as some of the chemical properties of a species. So lipids span on many orders of magnitude. Um, and in, in just an example I'm giving here is if we consider the low levels of endogenous bioactive fatty acids, like the nitrate of fatty acids, here is an example of nitroconjugate linoleic acid, which is found in plasma in low nanomolar concentrations. And if we compare this to a triglyceride, which is found at millimolar concentrations, we have to take into consideration for our sample, do we have enough sample to measure this where, so for instance, in plasma, we may need 200 microliters to extract these bioactive fatty acids, whereas we may only need 10 or 20 microliters to look at triglycerides. And so is it realistic that over this large, um, five to six orders of magnitude range that we would be trying to analyze both of these different species in one analysis. Um, more than likely, you're gonna end up doing a targeted analysis of either oxylipins or nitrated fatty acids um, from your biological sample. Another thing to think about regarding chemical properties is the partitioning of species into multiple phases. And two um, groups that come to mind, particularly for me, are the acyl carnitines and free fatty acids. And so in running the core, we often have a lot of collaborators who come in and they wanna perform some type of metabolomics analysis um, in addition to some type of lipidomics analysis from their same biological sample. And so in using a liquid liquid extraction or a modified Fulch or MTBE extraction, there are some species based on especially acyl chain length for um, the acyl carnitines or free fatty acids that might partition into um, both of these phases. So shorter chain lengths and um, mid-chain acyl carnitines and free fatty acids are gonna end up in your, more of your polar phase, whereas the longer chain um, fatty acids and acyl carnitines will end up in your organic phase and may actually be visualized in a global lipid profiling analysis um, using a reverse phase column. Also, the chemical structure can um, greatly impact ionization efficiency. So just a stark example to show you here, if we think about two very abundant lipid species in plasma, cholesterol and triglycerides. We can see here for cholesterol, our internal standard is at 2.5 nanomoles. This gives us an, a, a signal intensity of 1.8 E to the six, whereas um, triglyceride um, detected as an ammonium addict is about three times less in amount. However, we have a signal intensity of 1.7 E to the eighth. So two orders of magnitude higher than the cholesterol um, present here. Cholesterols and other sterols are relatively poor, uh, poorly ionized because of their chemical structure. They don't also, they don't give, provide much information um, and, are, and are challenging to fragment. Whereas we can glean some structural information from the MS2 or MS3 of the triglyceride. And so I just wanna reiterate um, here, we know that we're looking at cholesterol and triglycerides, but in global profiling analyses before we really have an ID or what we think is a confirmed or even putative identification for a lipid species, we shouldn't assume anything about the signal intensity being related to the concentration because um, that often cannot be the case, not just based on the chemical structure, but also on um, ion suppression coming from complex biological matrices. And so we can employ chromatography. I'm a big fan of, of chromatography as um, adding a third dimension to our analyses. So in addition to mass to charge and, and signal intensity, we can separate out species over, um, in most cases, a gradient. 
and resolve chromatographically different species. And if we know something about our system, in particular our stationary phase, which we've heard now many different examples of separation techniques, we can glean some perhaps structural information or, or some hints at what we may be looking at if it's a lipid that we haven't, don't have a confirmed ID on. So just by example, um, reverse phase, we know that there's order evolution by carbon chain and degree of unsaturation. And chiral chromatography, which is, um, I would say, somewhat underutilized, is a great way to separate out stereoisomers of interest. And so just for an example, for a reverse phase separation of free fatty acids, this was done on a um, Acupor C8 column. And I believe this analysis was um, mass analyzer was the QE. In this case, we were actually um, looking at free fatty acids in a positive mode um, because we've derivatized with picolilamide, which provides us with a um, permanent positive charge. And here we have linoleic acid with 18 carbons and two points of unsaturation at a retention time of 5.49 minutes. If we add another degree of saturation, unsaturation for linolenic acid, 18 carbons and three double bonds, we see because we're using a reverse phase column, um, this um, lipid free fatty acid becomes more polar and the retention time is shifted to the left. And so we can look at that for um, all of our carbon chain lengths here and our um, degrees of um, unsaturation. One thing I would like to point out um, when using reverse phase chromatography is that if we are using deuterated internal standards, you will always see that the deuterium, because it's slightly more polar than hydrogen, will cause the internal standard to elute slightly earlier than the analyte of interest. And so this would be the opposite um, using normal phase chromatography. Um, so in some cases, um, this doesn't seem so bad to look at right here, but this can get a little hairy in some very complex matrices. Um, depending on what lipid species you're looking at. And this is why sometimes carbon-13 internal standards are preferred, although they can often be much more expensive and harder to find. And so I don't really need to um, introduce icosanoid formation from arachidonic acid, as that's already been done by Ed Dennis, and we'll hear more about that, I think, coming up. Um, I just wanted to show this slide just to um, reiterate the number of positional isomers that can be formed from either reactive oxygen species or from enzymatic um, oxidation of arachidonic acid to form the hydroxy icosa tetranoic acids. And um, one methodology um, that we used um, and is still used, um, I'm just not in the lab anymore, um, in, in Ian's lab is the, to use chiral normal phase chromatography to separate out the RNS enantiomers of the different heat products. And this um, can be really important when trying to glean some biological information from what's going on in your system. So it's um, fairly well mapped out now um, as to what enzymatic um, um, enzymes are um, making which um, enantiomeric um, products. And so without using this chiral um, normal phase separation, if we were just measuring by reverse phase, our heat um, species, we wouldn't be able to infer whether these were enzymatically formed or if they were formed through reactive oxygen species unless we had um, some more information. Um, so this um, work was done on a TSQ quantum ultra originally using a Carl Pack AD column. Um, it's been since transferred over to a high resolution um, QE, so a quadrupole or trap um, hybrid instrument. And here we're, we're just showing an example of the extraction of heats from 200 microliters of serum, where we can see um, we have separation of the enantiomers, um, and only we see a product uh, for 12S heat. And this is because 12S heat is coming from platelet-derived 12-lipoxygenase. Um, and this would otherwise not be confirmed if we weren't separating out these enantiomers. Something else I just want to draw your attention to, though, is these two um, arrows here. So we're looking at 12 heat in the transition for the product ion of 179. But we also see small peaks in the transition for 15 heat at 219, and in um, transition for 11 heat at 167. And that's because heats are positional isomers with diagnostic ion patterns. So I wouldn't even say necessarily um, we use these diagnostic ions to quantify, but um, here's the example of the 15 heat full MS2, where we are, we, here you can see the 219 is the highest product ion, but there's also, um, ions for 167, um, which we use as a diagnostic ion for 11 heat, and 179, which we use as the diagnostic ion for 12 heat um, present. So 
it's really important, I think, to understand your system and to understand what you're measuring. Even um, by reverse phase chromatography, you can fairly well separate out these positional isomers. But um, this is why it's not good to be measuring um, specific isomers, perhaps in isolation. Because here is an example where we're looking at 15 heat. Um, again, we're monitoring at 219, and we see we have a pretty high signal intensity of 8e to the 6. But at the same retention time, we also see um, carry over into the 179 channel um, for 12 heat and the 167 channel for 11 heat. And so without having a good understanding of our chromatography, we may um, accidentally um, quantify this um, peak here, which still looks like a very nice peak or this peak for 11 heat, um, which is mistakenly just carry over from the 15 heat channel. And you can see um, if we look more closely at the ion and the signal intensities here, we have E6, where in these two channels, we have E to the four. And so in addition to the sample and analyte and the chromatography, we also need to talk a little bit about mass spectrometry and some considerations about mass spectrometry. So it's good if you're coming into this field um, to really have an understanding or at least a general understanding of the different types of mass analyzers, um, what you can do with low res versus high res. Um, Gerhard described this very nicely earlier um, today or this morning for me, maybe not for you guys. Um, and this is really important. Um, even if you're giving your handing your samples off, I think to a core for analysis, um, it's good to have an understanding of, of what's being performed and what the limitations are based on um, what type of instrument you're using. Um, so um, the mass accuracy is the ability of the mass analyzer to assign the mass of a theoretical mass of an ion or the mass of an experimental ion to its true theoretical mass. The mass resolving power, which is really just a more, you can think of as a performance parameter of the mass analyzer. So for, for orbitraps, this is often given at a mass to charge of 200 and a mass to charge of 400 for high resolution TOF instruments. Mass resolution is the ability of the mass analyzer to separate out adjacent ions. And so mass resolution and mass accuracy go hand in hand. You can't really have high mass accuracy without high mass resolution. Something else to consider is the scan rate. So the rate at which the mass spectrum is acquired. And this really comes into play when we're thinking about um, quantification of different species. Um, and so this needs to be taken into account. Also, there are many different scan types um, that can be utilized for your analysis. And again, we need to think critically about what we're trying to measure and what's best to provide the information that we need um, in terms of confirming an identification or um, for our publications. And so there's full MS, selective reaction monitoring, data dependent MS2, precursor ion scans, and so forth. And so even with high res um, mass spectrometry, there are definitely still limitations to what we can, what information we can obtain. Uh, many of this is, much of this or all of this has really been um, discussed already, but I think these are always important points to drive home. And I think you'll hear them reiterated throughout the week um, in different presentations. And so um, in terms of relative comparisons, um, what I talked about previously about comparing within an experiment, but not comparing um, between experiments is really important. Um, also, another consideration to take into account is um, trying to um, patch experiments together. And so that happens a lot in, in, in the core setting where we'll run an analysis for someone, um, in, you know, an untargeted um, or more of a profiling study. And then six months later, they come back with additional samples and they want to combine the data from one experiment to the other. When you're not doing absolute quant, it is very challenging um, to um, put those experiments together because the mass spec um, and the chromatographic system has seen so many different things <clears throat> in between these two analyses. So it's, it can be really challenging to do that. And that's something to, to think about when measuring clinical samples, often we collect samples over time, but we really shouldn't be doing more of an untargeted analysis until all the samples are collected at once. Um, as we've also heard, um, stereochemical confirmation, double bond assignments, unless we're using special chemical techniques, we're probably not gleaning this information. Um, and as um, Matt Conroy showed us very um, profoundly the other day, this information is all, often overstated in publications, and we need to be wary of this when we publish our own data, but we also need to be wary of this while we're re reviewing other publications. Also, um, for complex lipid acyl chain assignments, um, really, we need to be doing things like MS3. And so 
just to give you a brief overview, um, these are probably the most frequently used mass spectrometry technologies. So the triple quad, which may be um, very insensitive for a uh, full scan mode, but is really great for targeted stable isotope dilution quantitation methodologies. And then in terms of high resolution mass spectrometers, most commonly um, we'll see um, lipid analysis done on a TOF instrument or an Orbitrap um, hybrid instruments. These are um, very sensitive, have very fast scan rates. So TOF instruments um, historically have faster scan rates than the Orbitrap instruments. Um, whereas the trade-off is that the Orbitrap instrument often can reach mass, much higher mass resolutions, making this um, per perhaps a preferred choice for um, isotope um, analysis and tracing studies. However, I would think, I think now um, the preference between TOF and Orbi is um, more so on um, determined by what you grew up with and what you're comfortable with. And also perhaps if you're not just measuring lipids in your lab, but what other species and metabolites are you measuring, um, it can be um, play into the, to the fact of um, what instrument you end up using for lipid analysis. And so just quickly, this um, is a kind of busy slide or can become very complicated, but um, I think this is one of the best, better slides I've seen. I took this from Bernard Rochat's um, publication, looking at how mass accuracy and resolution um, come, can, are related to one another. And so for those of you um, who are more um, novices um, in terms of mass spectrometry, when we look at mass accuracy, we can take the theoretical mass and we subtract out the mass we measure, the experimental mass, and divide by the theoretical mass and multiply by 10 to the six to obtain a mass accuracy in parts per million. Whereas mass resolution is um, the mass um, divided by the delta M, which is obtained at full width half maximum. So here um, is an example here of a theoretical mass at 199.00307. And we see here on a triple quadrupole instrument that because these are often unit resolution um, instruments, so below 10,000 resolution, we have a very wide peak. And the mass is often taken at the apex of the peak, which, per, which is giving us a mass mean of 199.05. Um, almost overlapping with this um, dotted line here is the high resolution measurement at 199.00275. So much higher mass accuracy. If we look over here at the calculations, we see that the mass accuracy of the triple quad is 236 parts per million, where the high resolution mass spectrometer is only 1.6 parts per million. And we can also calculate the resolution by looking at this full width half maximum peak height and looking at this delta here, um, which then allows us to calculate mass resolution for the triple quad at 333 and 57,000 for the high resolution instrument. So these are just things to take into account when thinking about what types of lipid species you may be, may be analyzing. And here's just an example of how resolving power can affect mass accuracy. So, um, this is not a lipid species, but I really liked this example here. Um, this is taken for isoperin, which is a metabolite found in animal feed. And the theoretical mass is 246.1606. And we can see here if the window um, is set at five, parts, five ppm at this retention time of 3.69 with low resolution, we, we see nothing here. And it's only as we start to increase resolution that we can start to see um, these two peaks resolving here, um, and only at 50,000 do we start to obtain um, more accurate masses here for this species at 3.69 minutes. Um, and at 50,000 and 100,000, we can baseline resolve these two different species to obtain high mass accuracy. So um, scan speed, as I mentioned before, is can be very important when thinking about um, quantification of species. And so, I think now mass analyzers um, are always coming out with improvements. There's been large leaps in instrumentation. So even Orbitrap instruments now have, are coming out, either the hybrid or the tribrid platforms are coming out with um, very high resolution and high scan speeds. And um, here we know scan speed can be very important in the number of data points we collect across a peak. And this is really needed for reproducible quantification. And so the generally accepted rule is that 10 data points across the peak are needed for this. And so uh, there was always a concern um, not so long ago that could the mass spec keep up with the chromatography 
is UPLC or GC. I think that's not so much of a concern anymore, but it's always really important to check this when quantifying your lipid species. And so here we can see as we increase our scan rate, we, um, it can increase the number of data points and across the peak. And you can see these here, these um, numbers here for the scans across the peak. Um, and those are increasing as we increase our scan rate. And so I think everyone is um, harping on this this week, which is I think one of the most important things as well is that the structural information that you are reporting highly depends on the instrument platform and the method used for analysis. And so again, as we saw, structural information is often overstated in lipid annotation. And so when we're going to publish our own papers on lipid species that we've um, analyzed and detected, or um, also I think very importantly, if we're reviewing publications, we really need to think critically about the methodology, the analytical methodology that's used. Um, this can be very challenging sometimes because especially in high impact publications, the analytical foundation of the paper um, is a very minuscule part um, of the maybe 12 figures with 20 different panels that go on to describe this, um, this finding in different disease models or mouse models or in clinical samples. And you know, in my opinion, a lot of times this analytical rigor gets lost in the mix. And so it's really important to, to think about this. And so only the experimental um, determined information should go into the assignment. I think we all very well know that now. And so just as a quick example, if we look at a triglyceride, um, that was analyzed using reverse phase high resolution mass spectrometry on um, one of the Anquish IDX system. We can see here our, at um, the end of our C18 column, we have a nice packet of triglycerides, obviously with many species present. And these were detected as ammonium adducts. We can hone in on this 874.785 species. And we see here um, chromatographically, this looks like a single peak. However, I think we should know very well by now that just a single peak does not represent one specific species, um, although this is the predominant ion. Here, we also see many other triglyceride species underneath this, um, this single peak present here. And so we really need MS2 information to glean more information about this uh, triglyceride, triglyceride 52.3 species. And so if we do a full MS2 on this, um, on this uh, TG523, we see here our um, diacylglycerol-like species where we have our loss of our fatty acyl chains here at 601, 575, and 577. We can zoom in um, on the lower part of this mass range, and we can see here our acylium ions for our um, fatty acid chains, um, as well as our acylium plus 74 um, fatty acyl chains for our 16, 0, 18, 1, and 18, 2. However, what's really important to note here is that we don't know the position of these um, fatty acyl chains on our tri triglyceride, and we can't confirm these positions without doing further um, analyses, including MS to the third. Um, the IDX has this capability, but I can tell you that in practice, um, at least in a core setting, many people will never get to this part because they are so overwhelmed by the amount of lipid data and lipid identifications to go through, um, I think in their minds, right? We can think of this as like going through RNA-seq data that unless they're really honing in specifically on triglycerides, it's very unlikely that we get to this level of identification in um, different collaborations. Um, again, I can't say it enough, I think, what you need to publish and what you should be looking for as a reviewer are the same thing. So is there a representative chromatogram and a product ion spectra from the raw data? That's very important, right? This has to come from our biological findings that can be compared to a standard. Um, as I mentioned, this could be perhaps already published and a reference that we can find, or even if it's ending up in the supplemental, it's really important um, to provide confidence in our analysis. Um, just a quick example, not that what we're measuring here exactly matters, but I just wanted to demonstrate that, you know, when we extract chromatograms and product um, MS, full MS2s, um, this is what the raw data looks like. We can do some manipulation in terms of making our lines thicker, enhancing our fonts so we can actually see this in, in the manuscript. 
but really um, we don't need to do much arts and crafts or manipulation of the raw data. Um, that should, it, you can think of this akin right to a Western blot where we're showing the Western blot in quantitation, we show a representative Western blot in the, in the paper and perhaps we show um, the full Western blot in the supplemental. And so I think that's really important um, in terms of reviewing um, lipid um, mass spectrometry publications is to really create a checklist for yourself. I think the lipid maps group might even have a checklist that they could provide. Um, I think this is really critical moving forward as you could even see from Matt Conroy's um, example that lots of publications come out with no um, interrogation of the analytical data. And so I will just leave you with that. And I'd like to um, thank those in my lab who work on the different electrophilic fatty acid signaling pathways, collaborators at Pitt, including Bruce Freeman, Francisco Schofer, Stephen Wilcock, who made the 15 oxo lipoxin A4. And of course, I think I have to pay homage to, um, to Ian Blair and the group at Penn. Um, this is where I started out working on lipids and mass spectrometry. Um, and my close uh, collaborators um, in uh, lipid signaling, Clementina Masaros, Nathaniel Snyder, and also the core um, here at Pitt who work with me. And thank you. And I can take any questions. 